Your work has explored things like uh, human enhancement and telepathy. How did you gravitate toward those topics? Like a lot of geeks, I grew up reading science fiction. And then around the year 2000, I was reading a lot of actual science and scientific journals. And I found out that a lot of science fiction ideas were becoming actually possible. That scientists were implanting electrodes in the brains of animals, of mice and rats, and getting them to move robot arms by thought mm. to help people who were paralyzed and so on. So that fascinated me. I started reading more about it, and I started writing more about it. So I read a post of yours recently where you suggested that the word singularity actually does a disservice to the concepts behind the singularity. What is that problem, and what alternate term would you suggest? We can get very, very excited about things. Uh, the word singularity means something. In math, it means a divide by zero. Mm. It means a place where the graph suddenly hits an asymptote and, and goes like that to infinity. In physics, it means the point around a black hole where we, the normal models of physics say that the density goes to infinity. It probably doesn't, but our normal models of physics break down there. And we talk about that as an AI bootstrapping itself and going to uh, infinitely smart in a short period of time. We're not adequately or realistically representing what's going to happen in the future. And we're doing amazing things in AI, things like you know, machine learning and big data, deep learning, the Google self-driving car. Those are amazing, and they have positive consequences for society, probably mostly positive. They have some negative things we should think about, what's going to happen to people who drive cars for a living. But it doesn't look like a divide by zero moment mm. for society. So I think by getting a little too science fictional about this, am I getting a little bit too uh, apocalyptic about this? We're kind of uh, missing a chance to deal with it more realistically about what's really happening. It does seem to tend towards the, oh, we flipped the switch, here we go, right? Yeah, we flipped the switch, here we go, and for good or ill. Mm. People get a chance to say, oh, I'm not worried about my health because the singularity will happen and then I'll live forever. Oh, I don't worry about climate change, the singularity will happen and the AIs will deal with it. Well, sure. yeah. <laughs> Is there a better term that you think could be used? It's just the future. <laughs> All right, fair <laughs> enough. That's just as good, I guess. Um, what's your take on the Internet of Things? The Internet of Things is uh, its a lot of cool stuff happening. I mean, it's, we are connecting more and more devices. We're going to keep connecting more and more devices. There's definitely problems. And I think, uh, interestingly, the problems seem to be getting more and more play. Uh, security, perfect security is not possible. We know that. And so as more devices and more objects get connected, we're going to have security issues with those because more things will become hackable. That said, I think we are going to see a couple awesome things happen. And it's probably not the scenarios that are easiest to communicate right now. Because people talk about, hey, your toaster is going to be online. Sure. Who really cares? Right. I think about um, two big scenarios that I care about. One is energy and energy efficiency. As you get more objects that are consuming energy and sometimes producing energy, uh, wired so you can get data in and out of them, you suddenly have the ability to be much smarter about when you're using energy, how much, and how. Uh, so there's all kinds of waves in the power system. There's certain times of day there's much more demand and much less demand. So if your house mm. is online, if your car, perhaps electric in the future, is online, we can be tremendously smarter about load balancing that. And so Google's acquisition of Nest, you can think of Nest as an Internet of Things device. You can also think of it as a smart grid device. So that's one uh, direction of the Internet of Things, and that's going to have a payoff, I think, in, in dollars, in energy efficiency, and indirectly in, in climate and environment. The other one, people don't necessarily think of it as Internet of Things, but I do, is uh, personal body and health monitoring. I think it's the Internet of You. Like the number one thing most of us really care about is ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know, kind of personal network devices that track ourselves are in their infancy. And that's going to be probably the number one uh, area that we're going to want to get more data about for our own well-being. So less toasters, more personal yeah. stuff, right? Yes. Okay, I understand. Um, y you mentioned energy efficiency before. Now, you've re r written recently about price reductions in batteries and solar power. Are we nearing an inflection point for those technologies? We are. Uh, we're at that inflection point, I think, or we're in the right decade for that. So we're all familiar with Moore's Law. It, it drives our industry and tech. Uh, that you know, prices of computing, price performance just 
uh, has this exponential trend uh, doubling every 18 months, the computing power we get per dollar. What fewer people know about, though now we're waking up to it, is that in solar power, there's something called Swanson's Law, where we see uh, a doubling of price performance historically about once a decade, it seems to be accelerating. The price of solar panels has dropped by in half in about the last three years, and it seems to be keeping up that new pace now. Uh, wind power, the price has gone down by a factor of 10 in the last 20 years. Uh, and battery power, the price has gone down by a factor of uh, 20 in the last 20 years. So all three of those uh, areas in renewables have had tremendous price reductions and continue to. And there's headroom in that. And so that's very, very important because we know that from a climate perspective, we have to decarbonize. We have to get off of coal and natural gas and oil. All of that said, carbon emissions are still going up each year. Renewable energy and nuclear and hydro, all non-carbon energy makes up still a tiny fraction of the world's energy sources. If you look at just renewables, just solar and wind, it's still less than 2% of the world's energy production. So we're starting from a very, very, very tiny baseline, and we're still losing ground to coal in a certain sense. But those exponential price decreases mean that in the next few years, if you're going to build a new power facility, at least in the US and probably around the world, you're probably going to choose solar or wind. And then at some point down the road, as you're decommissioning old plants, you're going to always replace it with renewables. And then at some point, it might make sense to just stop even operating an old plant and retire it early and put in a new renewables facility as well. So that's that's the most optimistic trend that I see in terms of fighting climate change and, and starting to make a, a turnaround in what's, what we're doing. What's the timeline on that? It's it probably, sounds long. It's quite long. I mean, changing the energy system of the planet, this is something where we have spent uh, more than a century putting in place this fossil fuel energy system. It's going to take decades. People look at exponentials and they say, oh my gosh, in 15 years, we're going to switch to a, an all solar world. Well, A, it's not going to be all solar. It's going to be a mix of energy for quite a long time to come. And we're talking about 40, 50 years to make that switch over. And it might not be fast enough, even with that exponential trend in prices. But it's still, we're about to turn that corner. And once people see that corner being turned, that might give us the confidence to make more policy changes too, to further accelerate it. That's what I hope. Last question, last question for you. What, uh, what people or projects are you tracking these days? Uh, I track a lot on renewables. I track a lot on uh, what's happening in, in solar companies and wind and batteries. Um, I track everything Elon Musk does. Um, <laughs> good policy, yes. That's a very good policy. Yeah. Uh, solar and wind, everybody, everybody sees what's happening in solar. Batteries are the next thing in renewable energy. And people for, uh, are aware that without storage, Renewables won't work, but I think few people are aware of how aggressive the price reductions in batteries are. So I track a lot of battery companies. Many of them are kind of under the radar right now. Um, I track a lot in what's happening in the surveillance world. Actually, I'm going to be talking in a little while about rolling back the surveillance state, hmm. actually. And I think we're going to do better there than uh, people think, I believe. Uh, I think we're turning a little bit of a corner on that that will probably take a few years as well. And I read pretty much anything that uh, Corey Doctorow or Charlie Strauss puts out. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Mac.